And welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Berger. Very glad you could join us today. Also, welcome to those who are worshiping with us online. This past Wednesday, January 6th, was Epiphany. And Epiphany is the celebration of Jesus as Savior, not just of the nation of Israel or the Jews, but the Savior of all. That's why we often hear the account of the Magi or the wise men coming to visit Jesus on Epiphany. Well, this is then the first Sunday after Epiphany, where historically the church remembers the baptism of Jesus. And the two events fit together very well because Jesus' baptism also reveals that he is the Savior of all people. And as we consider Jesus' baptism today, that will also give us opportunity to consider our own baptisms. Everything you need for worship will be on the screen for you. We'll begin with two verses of God's own child, I gladly say. then will also follow the order of holy baptism. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. Our Savior Jesus Christ commanded baptism when he said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All of us are born into the world with a deep need for baptism. Because from our parents, we inherit a sinful nature. As a result, we are born without true fear of God or true faith in God, and we are condemned to eternal death. But Jesus took away our sin by giving his life on the cross. In our baptisms, God clothes us with the robe of Christ's righteousness and gives us a new life. Our sinful nature need not control us any longer. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives as together we speak these words. Baptism means that the sinful nature in us should be drowned by daily sorrow and repentance and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. We put our baptisms into practice every day when we confess our sins and receive God's forgiveness. And so also today, we'll join together as baptized children of God to confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, 
I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us. He has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing the last verse of the opening hymn. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved Son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Keep us who are baptized into Christ faithful in our calling as your children and make us heirs with him of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first reading from God's Word today is recorded in the prophecy of Isaiah, the first six verses of chapter 49. We can hear Jesus himself speaking through Isaiah as he tells us that even before he was born, God had called him for a specific role or ministry. Not just to save the nation of Israel, but to bring God's salvation to the ends of the earth. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is the word of our God. We'll respond with the opening two verses of hymn 89, reminding us of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River.
Gospel reading today, we hear how John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus to come by preaching repentance and offering baptism for forgiveness. But at the end of our reading, we hear how Jesus himself also came to be baptized. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 4. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated as we sing the remaining verses of hymn 89. from our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The word of God that I'd like to study some more with you this morning is the end of our gospel reading from Mark chapter 1, specifically the last three verses, 9 to 11, the account of Jesus' baptism. So did you make any New Year's resolutions this year? It's the time of year when a lot of people decide that they're going to go on a diet, exercise, maybe learn a new skill or reprioritize their schedule. But they got me thinking and wondering, why bother? I suppose a lot of people make resolutions because they're hoping to improve their life to some degree, and, and I understand that. But then I started to wonder if there was really a, a deeper issue to the idea of a resolution. I wonder how many people look in the mirror every day and they simply do not like the person staring back at them. And so then they hope that if they change the way they look or if they change some of their abilities or they change the way that they spend their time, then they can make a brand new self. I'm not sure that's the way it works. But do you like the person that you see in the mirror? Or would you like a brand new self, too? Today, as we remember Jesus' baptism, we'll learn that his baptism reveals his identity, and we certainly need to know who Jesus is. 
that will also give us an opportunity to think about our own baptisms. And I hope that you learn also that your baptism reveals your identity so that you can like the person in the mirror. Before his baptism, Jesus, I think, looked and lived like everyone else. We just celebrated Jesus' miraculous birth, but we really don't hear much about his life after his birth up until his baptism. We do know that the Magi came and on their way to deliver gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, they stopped in Jerusalem, the capital city. But when they asked, where is the newborn king, King Herod got a little upset. He was threatened even when he found that this new king was a baby. And so Herod sent his soldiers into Bethlehem to kill all of the baby boys two years old and younger, hoping to eliminate what he perceived as a threat to his throne. But God protected Jesus. God sent an angel to to Joseph in a dream, and, and Joseph immediately took Mary and Jesus even further away from home down to Egypt. And they remained there until the angel said that it was safe to return. And when Joseph and Mary returned, they didn't go back to Bethlehem. They went all the way back to their previous hometown of Nazareth in Galilee in the north. And that's where Jesus grew up, looking and living like everyone else. We do hear about the one time when Joseph and Mary took Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem at the age of 12, but the only other thing Scripture really says is that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with both God and men. But everything changed at the age of 30, when, as Mark records, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee to be baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. But Jesus didn't need baptism. John had been preaching, repent, repent of your sins, prepare the way for the Lord, and then be baptized to receive forgiveness for your sins. But as the holy and sinless Son of God, Jesus did not have any sin of which to repent. He didn't need any forgiveness. So why was he baptized? Well, by being baptized, Jesus took the place of sinners. Jesus formally entered into his ministry of preaching and teaching, and he would do miracles, but ultimately, Jesus began the walk towards his suffering and death to pay for our sin. Jesus was baptized not because he needed forgiveness, but because we did. And two things happened at Jesus' baptism So that everyone else would know exactly who Jesus is. That his baptism would reveal his identity. First, Mark says that as Jesus came out of the water, the heavens were torn open and the Holy Spirit came down and descended on him like a dove. I don't know what that looked like. I I don't know if it, it was similar to Jacob's dream when he saw the ladder or the stairway going from earth to heaven with angels going up and down. I, I don't really know exactly what Jesus saw. But I think that everyone saw the dove. And the Holy Spirit came down for two specific purposes. First of all, God sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to Jesus to anoint him. Now in the Old Testament, that was a fairly common occurrence. Every time there was a new prophet or a new priest or a new king, he was anointed with oil so that everybody would know this is the man that God has chosen for the job. I guess it's similar to a presidential inauguration or a judge being sworn in or even a pastor being installed at a congregation. By anointing Jesus with the Holy Spirit, God was telling everyone in the whole world, this is the one that I have chosen for the job. Not just to be prophet, but also to be priest and king and ultimately Messiah or Savior. At the same time, The Holy Spirit came to give Jesus the strength he needed to carry out the job. But then something else happened. While Jesus is standing in or just out of the water and the Holy Spirit is on him in the form of a dove, then a voice came from heaven. God the Father speaks directly to his Son with another very important message. He said, you are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. I'm sure that also strengthened Jesus for the work he was about to begin, for his preaching and teaching, and specifically 
his suffering and death as Savior. Don't we all want to hear our dad tell us that we belong to him and he loves us and he approves of us? Jesus didn't forget that. He, he didn't doubt it. But I'm sure that he also appreciated God reminding him that, that even though Jesus came so that everyone else could become a child of God, Jesus is still the only begotten, the one and only eternally begotten Son of God. And even though God sent Jesus because God so loved the world, and even though he sent his Son to die, God still also loved Jesus too. And God was pleased with him. The Father was pleased that for 30 years Jesus had already lived a sinless life in our place and that he was now willing to move forward and also suffer and die in our place. But that voice also revealed Jesus to everyone else. Now God clearly revealed Jesus' identity as the Son of God who was also the promised Savior. God does the same thing for you in your baptism. You don't have to raise your hand, but I, I wonder if any of you were old enough to remember your baptism. Most of us are baptized when we're babies, and there's good reason for that, because we want to know that our, our little babies are forgiven of their sins and that they have saving faith in Jesus, and we want them to start growing in their faith as early as possible. But I always think that when someone's baptized at an older age, especially as an adult, they have a distinct advantage. The advantage is that they recognize and understand life before baptism. Most of us don't remember that. But we've all learned that before baptism, rather than being children of God, we were born in sin as children of the devil. He's an abusive father. The devil doesn't care about you one lick. The only thing the devil wants to do with you is use you for his own pleasure and his own purposes. And ultimately, he only wants to bring you to suffer with him forever in hell. And as such, the devil just abandons us when it comes to life in this earth. Which is why I think we can come back to the New Year's resolutions. Because so many people in this world are looking for someone who will love them. They're looking for a group of people to which they can belong. They're looking for some kind of purpose and meaning in life, more than just I have to get up and go to school or go to work and then go to bed and start all over again tomorrow. They're looking for a new identity. And that's exactly what God gave to you in your baptism. And whether you remember it or not, when you were baptized, the heavens were torn open and God sent the Holy Spirit from heaven right into your heart. I know you didn't see the heavens being torn open and I, I'm pretty sure there wasn't a dove that landed on you at your baptism. But when the pastor or someone else poured water on you and spoke God's powerful word, these simple ten words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. At that moment, God ripped open heaven and sent the Holy Spirit into your heart. And he came to give you a new identity. The first thing the Holy Spirit did for you was give you a bath. It's not coincidental that God commanded baptism with water and the Word. But the Holy Spirit didn't really wash you with water. He washed you clean of all sin through the blood of Christ. Jesus came and was baptized to become the substitute for sinners. And later, when he suffered and died on a cross, he poured out his blood as payment for the sin of the world. And only the blood of God's Son, perfect and holy, can cleanse us from all sin. And the Holy Spirit took that blood and he washed you completely clean. That's the beginning of your new identity. In Christ, in, in baptism, you are cleansed. Well, your mom taught you that after you take a bath, you're supposed to put on clean clothes, too. You probably, and if you have pictures, go home and look, but you probably came to baptism with that little white gown on, which is very similar to the pastor's white gown or a bride's white gown at a wedding. 
That white gown symbolizes the clothes that the Holy Spirit gave to you in your baptism. Sometimes we tend to forget that Jesus didn't come only to die on the cross. But the 33 years that he lived before his death were also for us. Though he was tempted in every way that we are, he never sinned. And after Jesus died and rose again, he presented his holiness to God. And in your baptism, when the the heavens were torn open and the Spirit came down, the Holy Spirit took Jesus' holiness and he gave it to you. He clothed you in the robe of Christ's righteousness. And now that you are cleansed of sin and clothed in holiness, you can stand before God, the almighty, all-powerful, holy God. There was another miracle that happened in your baptism that we tend to take for granted, honestly. When we're born because of sin, we don't know who God is. We don't know that God loves us. We don't know that Jesus is the Son of God who lived and died and rose from us. And even if we did, or when we do, by nature, Paul tells us in Romans 8, the sinful mind is hostile to God. We don't want anything to do with God, but in baptism, The Holy Spirit transformed you from an enemy of God to his child. He did that by giving you faith. You believe that Jesus is the Son of God, who lived a perfect life for you, who died on the cross to take away your sins, whose resurrection from the dead guarantees that even when you face death, there is life. And as a believer, that makes you a child of God. So when the Spirit came down from heaven, there was also a voice. It was God the Father. He was speaking directly to you. And he said, you are my child. Now, I've never been to an adoption ceremony. And I know that most people want to adopt babies. I, I get that. But I always think it's even more touching when someone adopts a teenager. Because as far as I can perceive or understand, when a teenager goes unadopted, they naturally begin to think, nobody loves me. Nobody wants me. I don't belong anywhere. But when a family comes along and says, I choose you, and we will love you as our own, and you are now part of our family, It's a touching moment. In fact, I don't know if any of you have Disney Plus, but if you do, you go home today and watch the new movie called Safety. And you learn a true story about a man from Clemson who essentially adopted his brother as his son. And then you stop and think, that's exactly what God did for you. Your father, the devil, left you abandoned on the side of the road. But God came along and said, I choose you. You. And I promise to love you. I've always loved you, but now I promise to love you as my own dear child. You belong to my family. You are a son or daughter of the Almighty God. You're a brother or sister of Christ. That makes you a prince or princess of the king and an heir to God's eternal kingdom. And God promises that he will always, like a father should, he will always do what's best for you. But once you find out who you really are in baptism, that you are cleansed from sin, clothed in righteousness, loved by God, and made his own dear child, that changes the rest of your life. It gives you a brand new purpose and meaning. You no longer have to live in this world just to get through tomorrow, or to make as much money as possible, or to have as much fun as you think you can. Now your life is all about Loving God. Giving thanks and honor and praise to the Father who sent His Son to make you His child. Thanking Jesus for coming. Thanking even the Holy Spirit for transforming your heart from an enemy to a child of God. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do anything different tomorrow. It just means you're going to live with a new attitude. It means that you're going to be a loving spouse or parent, or grandparents, or child 
It, it means that you're going to be a, a loving neighbor or employer or employee or whatever other roles God has given you. You're going to do all of that to show love to God. But understand this, that when the Holy Spirit came down from heaven, he also gave you unique and specific ministries. Like Jesus, who was God's servant Israel to display his splendor and bring salvation to the ends of the earth, God has also created you to do good works which he has already planned out for you. And the Spirit has given you unique gifts and abilities and opportunities to do just that. And they come up in your everyday life. So look for those opportunities. Look for the real purpose and meaning that God has given you, which is to glorify Him by serving others until He calls you home. So I have a, a final New Year's resolution for you. At Men's Group the other day, somebody said that it takes 21 days to establish a habit. Well, what do you know? There are 21 days left in January. So I'm going to challenge you every day for the rest of January, and maybe that will create a habit that lasts for the rest of your life to do this simple thing. Remember your baptism. But I don't just want you to remember, yeah, I was baptized. I want you to actually live out your baptism. Three simple sentences every day when you go to bed or when you wake up or any time you want. Number one, Father, forgive me. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Spirit, help me to now live in my true identity, a baptized child of God. And if you want to go on a diet or exercise or gain a new skill, do that too. But just remember, none of those things actually change who you are. Baptism does. Baptism gives and now reveals your new identity. As we sang earlier, you are a baptized child of God. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God transcends our human understanding. It will guard your hearts and minds in true faith and to life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to join me in confessing our Christian faith in the triune God. We'll use the Apostles' Creed. The words are on the screen for you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And you may be seated. We'll take a minute or two to reflect on the word that we have heard proclaimed to us today. And while we're doing that, if you have your phone or another device with you, I'll invite you to go to stpaulsfamily.com slash register and sign our online friendship register there. Today, no communion, so we're just asking you to put your names in there. That would really help us. And if you're online, we'd also really appreciate if you would go to that link and sign up there as well. Please put the names of everyone who is with you. And if you are our guest and we can serve you with God's word any further, we'd also invite you to give us contact information. Thank you.
We have a number of special prayers to include in our general prayer today. First, we'll pray for Leroy or Jiggs Heller. He is undergoing some tests to determine if he needs further medical treatment or surgery, so we will pray for him. And then we have had any number of our sisters in Christ enter their eternal rest this past week. We will pray for the family of Diana Rolstadt, Arlene Heineke, and Valerie Neckish. Mrs. Neckish is the mother of our members, Debbie Giddings and Vicki Walsh. We also last week prayed for Marlene Krieger's family and the family of Richard Butt. So we'll pray for these ones this week. Please stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with thanksgiving and praise. We thank you for revealing yourself at the baptism of Jesus. There you declared the one born at Bethlehem and adored by the Magi to be your dearly loved son in whom you are well pleased. Enable all of us to find in him our hope and salvation. And as you anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit, pour out that same Spirit on us so that we may serve you in this world. Take away our fear and doubt, overcome our laziness and indecision, and drive the ugliness of sin from our lives. Open our eyes to the glorious truth that as your baptized children, we are your servants in this world. Grant strength also to pastors, teachers, and missionaries. Help them proclaim your word with fervor and diligence to bring light to those who still sit in darkness. In mercy, we ask you, Lord, to bring help and healing to the sick and afflicted. We especially pray today for your servant, Leroy Heller, who is ill. Relieve his distress, strengthen his faith, and grant him recovery according to your will. And Lord of life, we also pray for the families of Diana Rolstadt, Arlene Haneke, and Valerie Neckish, whom you have taken to yourself by death. Be with those families and comfort them in, in their sorrow with your sure promises of life everlasting, resurrection of the body, and reunion for all of your baptized children. We ask all these things, Lord Jesus, in your name as we also join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated for our final hymn verse. It's from 200, hymn 299, All Who Believe and Are Baptized. your mighty word and gracious promises to the water of holy baptism. In baptism, you have cleansed us from sin, redeemed us from death, and clothed us in your perfect righteousness. Encourage us to remember our baptisms daily as we die to sin and rise to new life with you. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Once again, good morning and welcome to all of you. So glad that you could worship with us, those of you who are with us in person and also those who are worshiping with us online. We certainly pray that God's word has strengthened you in your new identity to live as baptized children of Christ. We also invite you to grow in your faith more through Bible study. We have two options on Sunday morning. Pastor Albrecht will lead a study uh, right up here in our Bible study area. And then our family impressions of Bible study for all ages will meet in the lower level. We also have another study on Thursday morning at 930 if that would be more convenient for you. If you are able to come back after the late service, so I'm going to say around 11.15, we could use a little bit of help just taking down the Christmas decorations. I'm hoping that if we get enough people, we can be done with that by noon. Also call to your attention that in two weeks, on January 24th, uh, during our Bible study time, we'll be having one of our quarterly congregation meetings. Our Janu January meeting includes elections, and so you can see in there uh, the positions, the positions that are open for election this year and those who are willing to serve. One correction, uh, Jerry Wenzel is not going to be running for elders. I think we're still looking for someone to fill that spot. Uh, also, one other note that at this meeting, uh, there will be a recommendation from the council to create a brand new committee called the Fellowship Committee. And you can see that Matt Albrecht has agreed to serve as chairman of that committee should the congregation grant permission to create it. I'm going to let you look at the rest of the announcements there. Something that's not in the bulletin, you heard about the funerals. Marlene Krieger had her Christian funeral yesterday, as well as Mrs. Neckish, Debbie Giddings, and Vicki Walsh's mom. That was at Emmanuel in New London. On Tuesday here at St. Paul's, we'll have a Christian funeral for Diana Rolstadt. She'll have visitation from 11 to 1 with service at 1 o'clock. And then Mrs. Haneke's funeral will also be here at church on Thursday with visitation again from 11 to 1 and service to begin at 1 o'clock. Finally, I need to announce to you that I have received another call to serve as pastor at St. John Lutheran Church in Redwood Falls, Minnesota. I was going to look it up today and I forgot to look on my Google Maps, but I think it's almost directly west from here. You go through La Crosse and you have to go past Mankato and another hour or so and you run into Redwood Falls. Similar to Winnicani and St. Paul's, a little bit bigger, a city of about 5,000. It's the county seat. Um, the congregation's similar size, a little over 800 souls. There is a pastor currently serving, he's just a little bit younger than I am, and one that retired. And they also have a staff minister who helps out with some of the youth programming. Uh, the one big difference is that instead of a daycare, which they're looking into because there's a new hospital coming to town, they do have a school that runs from 3K all the way up to grade 8 with, I think, around 170 students or so. And so then there's a principal and a staff. So the process of the call is that I've spent the last week and I'll spend another a little bit of time learning about the ministry at St. John and what exactly it is they're asking me to do. I think I've kind of figured out what I'm supposed to do here, but if you think I'm doing it wrong, you know, let me know. <laughs> but otherwise, we take a look at, well, here, here are the two uh, options to serve God and then you essentially wrestle with God and pray and ask, where can I serve best? And of course, there are considerations like the fact that my daughter would never want to move away from Courtney Romberg or any of her other friends. And so um, we, have, we think about those things too. If you have any input to offer, it is certainly welcome. I always appreciate input from the congregation. I'll certainly seek that input also from our leaders on the council. Uh, if nothing else, I would certainly ask that you would pray not, not only for me, but also for our congregation and the ministry we're doing here and St. John, as well as really the ministry throughout our synod. And with that, I'll transition to this month's Wells Connection, which is a review of the work that we do together as a part of the Wisconsin Lutheran Synod. It's a review from 2020. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. 2020 may go down as one of the most challenging years of our lifetimes. And yet, as we look back at the past 12 months, it's a comfort to know that the biggest battle has been won. Our eternal salvation in Christ is assured. With that knowledge, we go into the world, confident that we have the answers to life's most vital questions.
The pandemic affected all Wells Ministries in 2020. And by God's grace, our Synod responded to the changing situations. It's not a time to sit around. It's not a time to wait. Uh, the souls of, of, of people around the world need to be connected to the gospel of Christ. And, and more than ever, uh, we have the tools to do that right now. You just have uh, group after group after group of people who are saying, yes, we want to be involved in some way, in some fashion. Working together in 2020, Wells pressed forward in ministry. Wells World Missions now serves churches in 40 countries around the globe. In some places, the work is face-to-face. -face. In others, we are increasing the use of digital tools to enhance our reach. But the goal is always to nurture groups in the Christian faith as they move along the path to becoming self-supporting with local leadership. Every member of the Wells is in every way connected to this mission work. What we can do very, very well is train others so that they can speak clearly uh, about what Jesus has done for this world. God has also blessed our mission efforts here at home. Throughout 2020, Wells Home Missions assisted 123 congregations in various stages of development. We have found that when we start a new church, that singular purpose, that outreach focus is really embedded into the life of that congregation. Because there is no shortage of opportunities to share the Savior's love, our four ministerial education schools continue to prepare the future leaders of churches like yours. Despite the pandemic, enrollments held steady as our schools graduated the next generation of pastors, teachers, staff ministers, and missionaries. We make an investment that most other church bodies don't make in ministerial education. We care about the gospel enough that we care about the people who bring the gospel and we want to give the best product we can to the church and we want people to be able to use their best gifts for the sake of bringing you the gospel. Congregational services continue providing timely resources to help share the gospel of Christ in churches, homes, and communities. In 2020, many additional resources were added online to help serve churches needing new modes of communication. Congregational Services is the group within Wells that helps congregations plan out aggressive gospel ministry, whether it's evangelism, Lutheran schools, worship, uh, discipleship, elder work. Looking forward to 2021, one of the more exciting projects is the new Wells Hymnal, which will be released later this year, along with 17 volumes of supplemental material. Another important event coming up in 2021 is the Synod Convention, to be held this summer at Michigan Lutheran Seminary, Lord willing. No doubt 2021 will bring new challenges and new opportunities. That's how it's always been for God's people. As a Synod, we'll walk together in Jesus to help each other as we do the work he's given each of us to do.